well, you know, Mr. Friedman, there you have it, you are wrong. Not that we ever followed Mr. Friedman's um, theories. Um, those were wrong from the beginning and from the outset. And, you know, one, one other critical, no, one other reflex you should have as an economist, I think, is, is the faculty of critical thinking and logic. You're talking about Milton. Friedman, Fri yeah. Milton. Milton Friedman. It is critical, critical thinking and logic is um, not a popular subject in schools, have you noticed? Why is that? <laughs> Why would that be? Never mind, I mean, we're not here to pursue um, conspiracy uh, theory, but um, it is a, a reflex that one has to, again, develop. And not only in economics, <laughs> that is something we have to develop everywhere. The intermediaries, as I said, will spread, will um, narrow all spreads. Um, arbitrage basically comes down to, to this, sell the expensive bills, sell the expensive bonds, buy the cheaper bills, buy the cheaper bonds, rates are tick by tick equalized over time and it won't take much because there's many arbitrageurs doing all day long nothing but that. That's how they make a living. Constant arbitrage, um, therefore, will always narrow spreads. Uh, it will bring them down as low as possible. We'll also bring discount as low as possible. And we know that the basics that we've covered here, they are inverse to the propensities either to save or to um, consume. Now that we know the different drivers, the different drivers of interest and the different driver of discount, the question remains, of course, whether you can actually get them to zero or what would they do? And according to Mises, zero interest was not possible. And mathematically he's right. It is not. You can always halve an interest rate, but I mean, what's, what's the word, an asym, asymptote? If you put a picture to it, it would become an asymptote and it will never reach zero. So as the propensity to save, the propensity to save increases to infinity, then zero rates would be dropping, uh, then interest rates would be dropping to zero. Uh, so he reasons that humans will save, of course, the last morsel of food. Now you should, well, one, on one way you can agree with this, because it is not possible, but also think of food that is a propensity to consume, which he has not differentiated here. Um, so one can actually have a pick a point, if you like, but we're not going to. Um, one can halve interest rates and halve them again on the other side, um, but you should note that under a gold standard, interest rates would tend to be stable and positive. High spikes, low troughs would be, although not impossible, they would be temporary and they would be without detrimental effect. And that is um, in part to the operation of the sinking fund um, working and, and, and perhaps also the explicit f clause in the fund that you recapitalize your bond when interest rates have moved up permanently. Um, actually, the message that we did receive so far is that people are in charge throughout the gold standard. And as long as people were in charge, things were stable. Of course, we... Uh, I never knew a gold standard, and I'm not sure Mises, Mises didn't live under a gold standard either. 
Um, we all know a fiat system. Um, we now know that time preference uh, of people has been teethless uh, in a way because gold has been um, removed. Circulating gold coin has been removed. And it fails to rein in bank expansion. And it fails to push interest rates back up again. And that is, of course, due to um, central bank diktats. And the central bank diktat is, of course, the cue for bondholders to ride out the whole capital gain game, if you like, uh, with, with bonds to the very end. And now to the very end, that means maybe low interest rates, maybe to zero. And not only that, uh, in, in a fiat currency system, despite all its legal tender and also its nominal debt laws, um, it is not capable of preventing currency from steady depreciation. <coughs> this depreciation must somehow affect time preferences of people also. And that is, of course, what we see in the exchange rate mechanism, which would alter the terms of trade in international trade. When those terms of trade have changed, prices would probably, and in all probability, they would go up. Sometimes they go down. But it's that mechanism instead of the quantity mechanism that would be operative. So the fact that, is, um, that a forced fiat credit based system uh, does not enjoy cordon, well, it, it doesn't enjoy uh, constant marginal utility. And authorities have known this because otherwise they would not have allowed us uh, some relief in the form of an index of a consumer price. Um, the, the mainstream economists um, since Friedman have invented that um, and they have invented other euphemisms such as the real interest rate as opposed to the nominal interest rate. Now, the former takes inflation into account, so they say at least. Um, I argue that since 1971, how on earth is it possible to calculate? We are estimating, we are guesstimating, but since 1971, the lattice that one has constructed under a gold standard is, well, is broken. <clears throat> it's not long ago, it's, it's only 40 years ago, but at this stage in time, you know, we're sort of hobbling along with whatever, whatever the remnants, we, where the lattice used to be. We're sort of in hovering in the neighborhood, but forget calculation. I don't know how you can calculate an exact index. It's at best a good guesstimate. Zero discount rates, would that be possible? Mainstream and American Austrians have in fact and I think the American Austrians do not recognize the difference, so they have done away with discount rate, and they have equated that with the um, interest rate. And it's already been pointed out by the professor that it is an extremely grave error, because now, um, look at the macroeconomic picture and the formula, such as the main, well, I'm going to take one. GDP was one. Um, some, un, some under you have had the advantage, or disadvantage, I should say, to study mainstream economics. The ISLM model should tell you something. Maybe it conjures up nightmares. It, it, did, it does with me. Um, never mind. The ISLM model, as far as I am concerned, is the investment savings uh, versus liquidity preference money supply model. And it's supposedly, what is it? It's supposedly representing the relationship between interest rates and real output in an equilibrium model. What we know about equilibrium models is that they are way too narrow 
Um, and where is the discount rate? It doesn't even come in there. It is, it is wrong. It is wrong. It is flawed beyond repair. Uh, and I feel sorry for Ludwig and, and Willem because uh, probably if it hasn't, if you haven't written exams on the RSLM model, then they will still be coming. And you have the, <laughs> the, the knowledge that it is wrong. And you'll still have to live with it. I'm, I'm, I feel sorry for you. Let us analyze zero discount. Well, zero discount would imply, imply infinite dis consumption. And of course, clearly the, the equation by the mainstream and the American Austrians that where they equate both is wrong. Zero discount excludes zero interest. Can you see why? Because the one is consumption, the other one is saving. Zero discount or infinite consumption would imply zero saving. And look at, look at our graphs of interest rates, short term and long term. Have you seen? Well, they run, they run in lockstep. So then you know that something's wrong. And you know that the um, figures have been uh, muddled or played with, uh, and that is that is, I mean that is completely misleading. The professor called infinite interest and zero interest, or infinite discount and zero discount. They are known as black holes. It's a term coming from out of space, yeah? literally. But in the real world, we can um, apply them here. Now, I do realize that, that in, in reality we do round up numbers like 0 0.0001. Mathematically that is not zero, but for all intents and purposes um, in the real life it is zero. With that knowledge in mind, um, what are black holes? Nobody has this model, hey? by the way. This is not Austrian economics, American Austrian economics, zero interest and black holes and zero discount. It is the professor's merit, uh, second merit then, besides um, marrying the time preference and uh, capital marginal duty, uh, marginal productivity of capital model. Besides that, uh, it is his merit that he highlights um, that when interest rates drops to zero, no credit will come forward. Have we had that time? Yes. Can it exist? Yes. It did exist. Think back the collapse of the Western Roman Empire. Zero interest would mean zero credit and zero credit I can give you credit for coming here but in, in this way zero credit would mean I'm not trusting you even if you are my neighbor under um, the collapse of the Western Roman Empire you I would like to put a, as big a distance as possible between my family and the next one I'll farm a subsistence existence as far away as possible now, that is totally contradictory to the cooperation model. See? <laughs> that is as far as you can get from a cooperative model, like the hexagonal model. Under zero interest rates, what do you do? Well, I mean, I've already said that the... Um, asymmetric bargaining position of the annuitant young and old uh, between them and uh, between the, the suppliers of credit uh, and the uh, users of credit, that uh, position is asymmetric because one of them can in fact do whatever he pleases. He can say, fine, um, I'm not giving you any credit and the entrepreneur um, as well as the inventor would be out of jobs. 
In fact, they would be out of existence. And that is zero interest rate because they can either this hoard, and usually the annuitant with a D would be a family member of the annuitant with a T. And they can do whatever it is that, you know, the younger son works for the father on the, um, on the farm. And we still have that remnant in society. There are cultures still today who, under natural law, revere the older generation. And it is not uncommon for several, uh, well, two, two generations, maybe three generations, to live in the one, under one roof. And that is not uncommon. It is maybe, sounds strange to us, you know, we all want to get our own, well, as a, as a youngster, the first thing I wanted was a car. <laughs> what, what else? Huh? But then, of course, then you want another house, because you don't want to live with the old <coughs> folks. We have been spoiled a bit. We have lost that natural value. The natural value, I think, is a leftover, well, leftover, it is essentially a natural law to have respect for the older generation. But the, re the leftover is that you can easily live together. And, you know, if push comes to shove, that community can stand on its own. It can dishoard whatever it has. That is, I think, a leftover, maybe a philosophical thought. In general, zero interest is possible because you should also imagine then that credit dries up, literally. So how does that tie in with our current situation? Aren't interest rates gone brought down to zero? So you may think, well, credit is still plenty. Interest rates are at zero. So what does that make of your model, Mr. Van Kopenola? Well, you may think credit is still plenty. I should urge you to test that. Go and see if you can get a mortgage. Huh? <laughs> Have a good look. <laughs> you may, you may. Just try and, and, and just have a look. Have a look at the numbers of unemployed people. The reality is that these masses of unemployed people are the, just the, the reverse of the medal of capital. Capital employs people. That's one and the same side, well, it's two sides of the same medal. No capital, no credit. You know, I said no credit. Well, then there's no, there's no partnership available for the entrepreneur and for the inventor. Try get a job. Hope you can get one. Really. I mean, that's maybe bad news for the youngsters. Then again, we're also not entirely, and mathematically, we will not be at zero. So maybe there is still a bit of hope. In any case, it is getting increasingly more difficult as credit is being destroyed by what? The black hole, of course, of zero interest. Which, soon enough, will translate in hyperinflation. Oh, you say, but hyperinflation, Mr. Van Koppenola, that is not your position. We are in a deflationary period. Well, let's realize here that um, Professor Fegete has written a paper in 2007 about the divide, the continental divide there is between the electronic dollar and the paper dollar, the Federal Reserve note, which matures into a slightly better instrument called the paper dollar, and it's slightly better. But nevertheless, the picture is there for you to understand. Electronic dollars and paper dollars, paper dollars may go to a premium. And soon enough there will be, because I'm going to talk also about negative interest rates. And this 
these two black holes will cause, on the one hand, a deflation, and on the other hand, a hyperinflation. Yes, uh, I still have five pages, so that, that won't do. Uh, <laughs> I will shorten this. I will shorten this. We have seen now that zero interest rates are possible. Were zero discount rates possible? Well, we've also seen this. Back in the year 1000, <clears throat> what happened in the year 1000? It was under Pope, I forgot his name. Say again? Pope? A Pope. Yes, popes were very important. John Paul. Not John Paul. No, in the year 1033, I believe it wasn't, well, you can look it up under. Oh, 1000. Under the year 1000. Well, what happened then? It was the first millennium. Just as now, and people then were um, very. Uh, the, the, the second, second millennium, actually. The, well, yeah, <laughs> that too, but we were less, um, less convinced of the second coming. <laughs> the first coming of Christ, we've, we've, you know, in the Judeo-Christian um, culture, um, it is important. The year 1000 marks the period where the medieval people would have thought there is this, the second coming of Christ. And they lived with abandon, as if there was no tomorrow. They went on a, what the youngsters would call today, a meet and greet. What is a meet and greet? Well, they went to Jerusalem to meet and greet the second coming of Christ. I'm not trying to um, make a joke out of this, but that's how they saw it. They thought they were going to die. That was the end of the world. It didn't happen in the year 1000. It didn't happen in the year 1033, because if you add the life of Christ, he died at the age of 33. They thought maybe we miscalculated this, and it's the year 1033. But of course, I mean, our records of that period are scant, and we don't know. But it didn't happen, obviously, otherwise we wouldn't be here. And it didn't happen in the year 2000 either. But that's when discount went to zero, and consumption was almost infinite. People lived up whatever they had, only to come back and start again, <laughs> if they ever made it back, of course. Um, how many minutes do we still have? Minus five. Minus five. There is an important thing I have to draw your attention on. We have seen in the New Austrian School that there is an alarm bell by the name of Basis trading and the uh, we thought in the beginning it was the um, permanent establishment of, of um, backwardation that was refined to permanent and widening backwardation that I, I, I well I mean obviously if you have eyes to see that is an alarm bell I would like to add my little input personally. Um, I'd like to draw your attention to a second major alarm bell. It, it rings incredibly loud. You should get a headache. And this is a paper by what I would call, well, he's not a scientist. Uh, my name for him is a, well, this, this paper was written by Mr. William Buter. He is uh, associated with the London School of Economics. He's written this paper for the National Bureau of Economic Research. And it, I think he is the CEO of um, Citibank. And if he isn't, then he was. Chief economist, I think. Sorry? He's the chief economist, I think. He is a chief economist. Well, there you go. Mm -hmm. I think this person belongs in, this, in the, in the um, section of the criminally insane that's where he is. It, it, yeah, thank you. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. He written a paper in 2009 after the professor wrote about the continental divide. And this paper says or gives negative nominal interest rates three ways 
to overcome the zero lower bound. I'll translate that for you. That's three ways to get at you. He advises, and I'm, I, know, I know I'm running short on time, but he advises the government of all people on three ways how to, you know, get some more juice out of the criminally insane system. And, okay, we, we, we run out of uh, time, but very shortly, this is, half of it we've already seen. Half of it we've already, go and try to take money out of a country, you get capital controls. Go and try to walk with a wad of money in your pocket to a shop. It is your $20,000, it is your 20000 whatever it is. Go and buy a car, cash. What's the problem? Is there a problem? Yes, there's a problem. The, the salesman will tell you that he cannot accept your cash. And you will answer in, with respect, sir, this is the money the government printed. It is your own money. And the government has criminalized its own money that it first promoted by hook and crook. It <laughs> has to pass through a bank. Do you see the vertical devolution in John Exter's pyramid? They want you to exchange it, so they can follow you, but that is, of course, another thing. After, they want to get, they want to purge out all the paper money and exchange that for other things, like the one they can inflate at will, but also cancel at will. And in fact, if they want, and this is one of his policy adv uh, advisors, if you have a wad of money in your pocket, how can the government take a negative interest rate? Well, a negative interest rate comes to this. They have to tax you. Or they have to somehow get, you know, tick by tick, cancel that money in your pocket. Now, obviously, it doesn't. But the money in your account, they have control of. They can, they can tell the banks, simply on that balance in that account and on all accounts, just take off 2% every month. Ding, 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 ding. There the mate goes. That is a negative interest rate on, bearer, on a bearer instrument, really, which has become not a bearer instrument because they want to get rid of bearer instruments. And we've seen this. Look for the increase. That was one major alarm bell. It will be now, you know, the sometimes the limit that you can carry in your pocket before you are arrested as a criminal. Um, sometimes the limit is 10,000, sometimes the limit is 2,000. Watch for those spreads narrowing up to 500. And then nothing, maybe just coins. That is your alarm bell. There is another more tricky one, and I'll conclude with that one. It's probably uh, a combination of both because the government can actually create a numeraire out of thin air and they would probably and that has existed the EQ was a numeraire or the, the euro was in fact a numeraire between 1999 and 2001 it didn't exist it wasn't printed so it is a money of account only so they can revert back to that and the dollar you know the amero remember they maybe they make the amero a, a unit of account and then, after that has been established, a, num a, num um, um, a numeraire of account, then they start changing the rates. <clears throat> and if you want to understand what changing the rates means, I, I, would, I would say um, there is a little article I've written in the Gold Standard Institute. It's historical, it's funny, it's about Jean Baudin advising the King of France in the 15th century about inflation. And it, it's so, you know, it's déjà vu all over again. So, I conclude that zero rates, both of discount and of interest, is possible. And even negative rates are possible, and that should be a damn warning bell for you. It's one good thing that the government doesn't... You know, I would love for the government 
to insist that gold is not money. I would love it, because then we know where to go. All into gold. And because it's not money, you cannot prevent me from carrying that around, can you? Right, here's where I conclude. Thank you very much. Thanks very much.